The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A quick show of hands, how many of you are people watchers? Yeah, I, I love watching people. It's my favorite pastime when I'm in an, air, in an airport, is to sit and just watch people go by, some that are really relaxed, and most of which, which are usually really uptight and kind of scattered and sometimes even frantic or angry. But it's just amazing to watch people. You can notice a lot of things just by sitting back and watching. In our gospel reading today, it seems like Jesus is a bit of a people watcher as well. So he's been invited to this, this banquet or this, this meal by a leader of the Pharisees. We don't really know how many people are there, but it sounds like it must be a bit of a crowd because you find all of the people jockeying for position. And he watches this. He seems to be standing back just watching all of them try to get to those places of honor and prestige as they find their place at the table. They're all trying to sit by someone who's maybe a little more important than they are simply so that it rubs off a bit on them. So they can appear and, and seem more important than perhaps they really are. To me, one of the things that's illustrated in this gospel passage this morning is the fact that it was clearly a culture and a time of honor and shame. And those two things played a key role in, in society and in culture. Position and stature, they were important, of the utmost importance. Power, wealth, your friends, your job, they were all a part of your social status. Maybe some things don't change too much. And the individuals would do whatever they could to elevate their stature. So meals and banquets where there were lots of people around, it was, it was the easiest and maybe the most important place to do just that. So they would try to make sure they could slide a little closer to the head of the table, to the host of the meal. In the midst of this self-promotion at the cost of others, Jesus offers a new perspective. And he, he tells them a parable, which I think is an interesting thing. I mean, just does he pause them in the middle of getting ready for this meal to tell them a story? That's what it seems like. But this parable, it... It includes the, the embarrassment or the shame of the culture of being asked to move so that someone more important than you can have your seat. Or the shrewdness or the honor that comes with being asked to move up when you've sat at a lower position. Being elevated in front of everyone at the table. The point that he makes in a couple of different ways in this gospel passage this morning is that humility is something to strive for. It's something to practice. It's, it's completely countercultural in his day. Probably in ours too, I would imagine.
as human beings, we tend to think pretty highly of ourselves. This passage reminds me of an interview that I did during seminary. And occasionally you had to do projects, so you'd go out to congregations somewhere around the area, and I'm not going to tell you which one. But I happened to be interviewing with a, a pastor and actually former bishop. And talking with him about a particular congregation, and I asked him, I said, if you could describe this congregation in one sentence, how would you do that? And he said, well, this Lutheran church thinks more highly of themselves than they ought to. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, a pretty bold criticism of a congregation, and yet I think that's probably fair of many of us, I think. We tend to think more highly of ourselves than perhaps we ought to. As individuals, as families, and even as congregations, it's so easy for us to see why we're so much better than others, right? Just like the people at the banquet almost stepping on the other if it meant that they could have that seat of honor or that place of prestige. What Jesus is telling them is that social, so social status doesn't really matter. Because around God's table, there is no seat of honor. All are welcome. But this passage, then, it doesn't leave us hanging. It makes an interesting transition because in the later part of the passage, Jesus gets around to talking also more about what really matters. He's seen a bit, pretty bold move, which is really nothing new for Jesus. He turns to the host of the party the host of the meal, and says in front of everybody who's gathered there, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, all of those people that you probably have just invited to this meal, in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be paid in the resurrection of the righteous. I don't know what that says, but... So is the, is the point of that that you shouldn't ever invite your friends to your party or to your meal? Or that every get-together that we have has to be about the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind? I don't think so. I think it's a matter of also putting this passage into the context of Jesus talking about discipleship and what it means. I think this reading, in this reading, Jesus is setting an expectation for God's people. That we humbly acknowledge that all of God's people are valuable, are precious in God's sight. And that as God's people, it is our job, it is our honor and our privilege and our responsibility to care for the vulnerable, to engage in conversation with those who are lonely, those who are desperate or forgotten. That we shouldn't base our relationships on what we can get out of the other person. That, I think, is a big part of our critique that these verses offer for our culture then and our culture now. You see, it was very common practice for people to only invite those to their party or to their meal or their luncheon that would reflect well on them, who would elevate their popularity or their status, or who would indeed invite them to their own next shindig so that they could elevate their status. Last week in the children's sermon, last week as one of our blocks up here says, blessing, we also did it as part of our, our backpack blessing. We heard about it on our Thursday's post on Facebook. We actually offer another blessing this morning for our prayer shawls. A blessing. That's what the end of our passage says will happen, that you will be blessed. I did a quick Google search and found an online definition, one that I, I really kind of like for blessing. The invoking of God's favor upon a person. That's part of the passage where we hear that we will be blessed if we respond in the ways, really in the ways that Christians should, in the ways that God's people are invited and challenged to respond to others. To others. 
by serving, by humbling ourselves, by acting like God's people. And we hear that, in fact, that in and of itself is a blessing. Now, I don't think this passage offers us a cause and a reaction, that if you do these things, then you will be blessed. That's not the language we have in this passage from Luke. But rather, I think it's an acknowledgement that when we act as God's children and disciples, that in and of itself is already a blessing. It is a reminder when we serve God and serve others, it's a reminder of God's presence with us each and every day and the blessings that God has already given to us. Because as God's people, we indeed are already richly blessed. For most of us, that means we, we have a home to live in, we have enough food to eat, we have clothes to wear, we have friends and we have family to enjoy. But God has blessed us so much more richly than that even. We have been blessed with talents and skills to be used in God's kingdom. We have been blessed with faith and a relationship with God. And above all, we have been blessed and given the gift of forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. Without Jesus Christ, those blessings those blessings are simply out of our reach. That's the good news of the story, though, that this message is one of the blessings that we offer to the world, that as we come to know Christ, those blessings are freely given to all. That in the midst of division and war and oppression and violence and poverty and discrimination, there is a God who seeks to give us peace and strength and nourishment a community, forgiveness, and salvation. So today, I leave you with blessings. Blessings from the one whose banquet table there's always room. Amen.